Somebody came in and said, what did I just come into? And the next person said, mother, I crave skin. <laughs> Edmund Kemper, born December, don't care, is an American serial killer, rapist, cannibal, and nephile who murdered six college students before murdering his mother and her best friend from September 1972 to April 1972, following his parole for murdering his paternal grandparents. I already know the title of this video. Bose finds out who Ed Kemper is. Somebody's gonna be like, bitch, you've been doing true crime for 10 years and you don't know who Ed Kemper is? Yeah, because I, if it says more, you killed more than two or three people, I don't even click on it. I don't wanna know, you crazy. This is a 22 minute interview with Ed Kemper. Yeah, this is definitely around the 70s. I say this all the time. The 70s were, it was, it was not fun. Well, I'm not an expert. I'm not an authority. I'm someone who has been a murderer for almost 20 years. Okay. Can you say how many people might be doing crimes like you were doing? It would be a guess, but it's not. It's far more than 35. Oh, sorry. I'm already jumping in on this. When he comes in hot, real strong here, and he says, I've been a murderer for over 20 years. That tells me that this is what Edmund Kemper believes his identity to be fully. A killer. A murderer. There are some people that would commit crimes like this and later go to jail and perhaps read a book or pick up some kind of job in the jail, maybe become um, a, a refuge for certain people, turn their lives around in some way, get another identity. But he wanted this title. So this was a man that had no other identity. He doesn't know what he is. He has absolutely nothing. And so then he kills and decides, I'm a murderer now. I'm going full force into that. And there's no way out after that. I lived as an ordinary person most of my life, even though I was living a parallel and increasingly sick life, other life. One victim let me back in the car. I locked myself out. She opened the door for me. I don't know if I believe that. My gun was under the seat. I don't know if I believe that. What the hell am I doing telling you that? Am I looking? Am I, am I a masochist? Am I looking to be tormented further? I'm trying to show you just how awful this got, how commanding these rages got. I was raging inside. There was just incredible energies, positive and negative. Another thing is this is an interview from, it It looks like, oh yeah, from 84, when they were sensationalizing a lot of these killers. You know, two minutes into it, I see a lot of jump cuts between, I wonder if this was the original one that was released, or if they wanted to put out the scariest statements possible for the most clicks. You know, between this, Ed Kemper could have said some real dumb sh** that they cut out just to make him look scary. A series of murders shocked Northern California. College girls began to disappear while hitchhiking. Two of the victims were picked up from the campus of the University of California at Santa Cruz. Hmm. That's where Ed Kemper's mother was working as an administrative assistant. You were involved in the campus because your mother worked there? Yes. I was also involved in killing co-eds because my mother was associated with college work, college co-eds, women. <laughs> He's and very he angry with very his family. And violently did they say what he did? Position on men. I hated her, but I, I wanted to that. love my mother. And I watched the alcohol increase. I watched her social life drop off. I watched her get bizarre. She had terrible pain from her life, earlier life, her upbringing, uh, a failed marriage with my father. I believe I'm a all of this. Reminder of that failure. Why did you actually kill the girls? My frustration. This is fucking ridiculous. This is absolutely fucking ridiculous. I feel like part of this comes from the societal thing where, listen, your, your parents, your mom, your dad, whatever, your grandma, they're people. They're human beings. They, they could have been traumatized. They could have been abused themselves. He's saying that his mom was an alcoholic. She treated him poorly and he hated her for it. Yet he sat there and wanted his mother's love so bad. This comes from the societal thing of like, no, your mother loves you. No, 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 you're supposed to love your mom. Look, if your mom's treating you like shit and, and she's a horrible alcoholic, move out when you're 18 and then go look for acceptance somewhere else. Don't kill your mother over and over and over and over again. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the case of Juana Barraza, but this is a woman that was a wrestler and she hated her mother because her mother sold her to a man for three beers. 
And after that, Wano was psychologically abused, sexually abused, every single type of abuse that was possible. And then when they were done with her, they were like, yeah, you can go back to your mom. After Wano's mother died, she began killing women that were the same age as her mom. I want to say that she killed over 30 people. Um, she's probably one of the most prolific female serial killers ever. And why was she doing this? Because she was killing her mother over and over and over and over and over again. And my question to you guys is, how fucking stupid is that? You know why you're mad? Because your mom sucks. Like, your mom fucking sucks. Like, but this is your life now, and you get to live it. You're in control. You don't have to chase your mother's love forever. My inability to communicate socially, sexually, I wasn't impotent. But emotionally, <sighs> I was impotent. I was scared to death of failing in male-female relationships. I knew absolutely nothing about that whole area. I need to be able to really communicate, and ironically enough, that's why I began picking people up. And I'm picking up young women, and I'm going a little bit farther each time. It's a daring kind of a thing. At first, there wasn't a gun. I'm driving along. We go to a vulnerable place where there aren't... Somebody just came in and said, Hey, fellow bozos, I see we're on some retro incel shit. That's exactly what this is. Th that's, that's exactly what this is. Uh, Scroob says, you're thinking from a rational mindset, though. He's a psychopath at this point. It, totally, absolutely. Pretty much, the reason why I do this is because the best thing we can do is learn from the failures of others, okay? And, and this is, he's literally saying what everything what was wrong. And I kind of feel like he knew what was wrong when he was committing these crimes, I, I, I feel like that, but we'll see, because he seems like he's speaking pretty honestly. Aren't people watching where I could act out and I say, no, I can't. And then a gun is in the car, hidden. And this craving, this awful, raging, eating feeling inside. I could feel it consuming my insides. This fantastic passion. It was like drugs. It was like alcohol. A little isn't enough. At first it is. And as you adjust to that, psychologically and physically, you take more and more and more. It's the same That's process. It's called addiction. It's called addiction. That's it. And if you're addicted to killing people, you have to fucking stop. This isn't like, it's not breaking news that you shouldn't kill people and you can't rationalize it by talking about it like it's an alcohol addiction. It finally came down to the thing of, do I dare bring this gun out? Already realized no! that if the gun comes out, something has to happen. No, don't do it. Was it was going to happen. I didn't see it then, but it was going to happen. I was playing a dangerous game with a loaded gun that got us all. On one occasion, Kemper picked up two roommates in Berkeley. In that first killing in May of 72, when that gun was pulled out, I launched it out. For it. I had it under my leg, out of sight. Peril I launched it out? What? Why did he say it like that? I launched it out like, like, like homie just couldn't fucking wait. Like he's sitting here acting like he was like thinking through the stages of addiction. Then he's like, I launched that fucking gun out. Jesus Christ, dude. How did this dude earlier say that he was likable? Like, do you guys like him? Parallel to my, to my leg in the seat. It was something that had been thought out in fantasy, acted out, felt out, hundreds of times before it ever happened. Kemper drove them at gunpoint to a secluded area near a park. He took one of them into the woods, leaving the second girl tied in the car. i just gone through a horrible experience with her roommate stabbing her. And I was in shock. Y'all hear that? Y'all hear what he said? Ed said that he had just gone through a horrible experience stabbing her roommate. It was horrible. And he was in shock afterwards. She wasn't in shock. It wasn't horrible for her, but it was horrible for him. That, that, comments like that really throw me off because it sounds like he's being so like honest and upfront, but then you say shit like that. 
I just went through a horrible experience with her roommate stabbing her, and I was in shock. I couldn't believe that it was that way. And I'm walking back there bewildered. I gotta kill her. I can't let her go. She's gonna tell on me. She's gonna tell on me. Everybody's gonna get me. Everyone's gonna get me. She sees the blood on my hands. What are you doing? And she pulled back and she gasped. And I think, whoa, I don't want her to know what happened. I said, your friend got smart with me. She'd been getting really smart with me a lot, but I never hit her. I killed her, but I didn't hit her. I said... No. Okay. The, he's see he's acting like he's being so like forthright and honest about every single little thing here well here's what i kind of think happened when he says your girl got smart with me I, he probably got into a lot of battles with his alcoholic mom you know if you've ever been in that relationship with a parent where maybe you're right about something or maybe you're even talking about your own feelings and your parent hits you with that whole i am the parent you are the child makes you feel powerless. When he says, your girl got smart with me, I think those were probably the exact words that he said to her, but he got triggered into a woman talking back to him just like his mom. And then he snapped and he killed her. It's not like it was this, like, no, he was furious. He was angry. He was taking his power back. He was expressing his anger through violence. Like, that's what that whole thing is, in my opinion. Your friend got smart with me and I hit her. I think I broke her nose. You better come help. She's about to die. Why, do, why does she have to know that? I couldn't deal with telling her that. Shut the fuck up. Now, he's bullshit. When I attacked her, she didn't at first realize what was happening. It didn't go through. She had very heavy coveralls on. It knocked her right up into the lid of the car. But it didn't pierce the clothing. So it wasn't that swell a knife anyway. I went out and bought a, a pawn shop huge knife. And... Uh, I kept on just mindlessly attacking. She falls back into the trunk. I just killed a young woman. I slammed down the lid of the trunk. She isn't dead. She's dying. And I panicked. I thought, I just locked the car keys in it because I can't find them in my pocket. Oh, my God, I locked them in the trunk. I'm kicking on the trunk lid and yanking on it. Oh, no, I don't believe this. I started to run. I also think that Ed Kemper knows a lot of the things that he's saying are very abnormal. I think he's very aware of this and I think he's embellishing it to an extent. Because like when he says, I just killed a woman and put her in the trunk, he knows that that's a very, very extreme statement. But then he follows it up by saying, but I locked the keys in the car. I, I do think this guy is smart and I think that for this interview, he's really laying it on thick because he knows the juxtaposition between those two statements is gonna shock people. So, to me, these aren't even really his real thoughts. He's just a piece of shit. And I tripped over the gun that I'd had in my pants that I had totally forgotten was there. I stopped. I said, stop and think. I collected my wits. Check all your pockets. I picked the gun up. I stuck it back in my pants, now remembering I had one. I checked all my pockets, and there's the keys in the back pocket. I never put them in my back pocket. Everyone makes mistakes, and that's what we have to hope for. The more mistakes they make, the better, better their chances. Who is he talking to? I thought I was pretty slick. What was that kind and of? tripped all over. Who the f*** was that? <laughs> the first 24 hours, there were three clear times I should have been busted, and I wasn't. Because three different... No. Okay. That shit is fucking annoying right there. Him saying, after the first two murders... Oh, no. This, God, I, I hate this f***ing clown so much. After the first two murders, I should have been caught. There was no reason why I should have been caught. What he's really trying to say here is, I'm so smart that I got away with it. There's The police should have found me. I was so sloppy, but I should have never gotten away with it. Ed, that's not because you're fucking smart. It's because there was no forensic testing back then. They, the, 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 like Police were running around with their heads cut off. There were murderers happening every every day, every hour, like all the fucking time. This has nothing to do with his intellect or how smart he was. It's more about how overwhelmed the police department was, but here he is trying to brag. I should have been caught. There was no reason why I wasn't caught. And I wasn't. Because three different individuals or three different groups of people got scared and minded their own business. Shut up. And looked the other way. Some of the people who are committing murders, even as we speak, if they're doing it by themselves and they tell no one about it, they could go on undetected until they decided to stop. And the police wouldn't catch them unless we just happened to roll up on them while they were doing it. 
Even after police warnings against hitchhiking and an increased bus schedule on the campus, Kemper had no trouble picking up hitchhikers. You know, I'm, I'm kind of curious about when the tides turned on hitchhiking. Like, when I grew up, like, you absolutely did. It was don't get in a stranger's car, don't hitchhike. Okay, most of us are kind of on that same page. So I, I guess it's from all the hitchhiking murders that basically happened, like, in the 70s and 80s. I'm telling you guys, it was a f***ing mess. Ironically, one warning advised riding only in cars with university stickers. Kemper's car had such a sticker. Oh. My mother worked at the campus, and I had an A sticker on my oh. car, and obvious access day or night to the campus. I was picking up some very lovely young women. You know what the, we were talking about as we're driving around? Almost as often as not, this guy that's going around doing this stuff. And the second <gasps> and they he enjoyed it, that, they he didn't enjoyed that. that they were getting a free he, ride. He loves feeling like he's smart. And he, in little ways, he's actually bragging about how smart he is, but he's not emphasizing it. He's just kind of dropping that nugget and expecting you to pick up on it and say that he's smart. Think, think about it, him sitting in the car with these girls that he doesn't murder, but you know, maybe giving them a ride home or something like that. And him feeling like, you know, he has the power of whether they live or die. He definitely enjoyed that. But he also really enjoyed talking about this crazy guy who was killing all these girls, knowing that he was that guy and just sitting there and he could act like he wasn't. He enjoyed being the smart guy. So how come they get in a car with somebody at that time? She judged me not to be that guy. Blaming her. I didn't look like it. Oh, shut up. It was getting easier to do. I was getting better at it. I was getting less detected. Look, bragging about himself again. I was getting better at it. I was getting less detected. And then he's going to switch. He's going to transition to something else. He's going to drop the nugget and like bragging about how smart he is. Then he's going to transition to something else. I started flaunting that invisibility, severing a human head, two of them at night in front of my mother's residence with her at home, my neighbors at home upstairs, their picture window open, the curtains open, 11 o'clock at night, the lights are on. All they have to do is walk by, look out, and I've had it. Why did you keep the heads? Why did you cut them off, and why did you keep them? Something out of my childhood. Uh, I could put it on an incident. I mean, my father chopping the heads off of our two pet chickens, and my mother insisting that I eat them for dinner. Uh, <laughs> you know, we could say it was something that simple. I don't think it was. Now, my dad heads out back with a hatchet. Actually, I think that's exactly what it was. I think that's exactly why he cut their heads off and kept them to take his power back. I'm sure that may have implemented something, that may have gotten something rolling but along fantasy lines, but it took a lot of years of development along those lines to really get off. But how are you able to, in a one minute, have someone's head in your hands and very shortly They're thereafter? Living through a fantasy, however that would relate to that severed head. And, and then five minutes later, I'd put that away and There'd be a knock on the door, and I'd put it away and answer the door. And the landlady would be there, and we'd discuss it. Discuss what? Actually, okay, so this is really interesting. I was reading about this before. Um, this was like a while ago where I was reading something about criminals that do very bizarre things at the scene of the crime. Like, for example, um, there are people sometimes that will kill somebody, and then they'll go in the bathroom and poop and not flush the toilet, okay? Okay. So for us, in our world, that's ridiculous, right? That's absolutely ridiculous. However, what kind of happens in the human brain is once you cross a massive morality like boundary, such as murdering somebody, you enter this other realm of morality where almost anything goes. Things that we wouldn't normally do or things that we would see as very bizarre, these people are willing to do once they've crossed that moral boundary. He was probably dropping hints, doing some odd things that he doesn't even realize he was doing because you have to basically come back to society after doing something like that. Your brain is just not in the right headspace. Some people go crazy at that point. I felt it, it was one hell of a tweak. I mean, to just flip out and not know where I was to be walking up the stairs with a camera bag that belonged to a young woman that had her severed head in it. 
walking up to my apartment past a happy young couple coming down. He the loves the shock. He nodded and smiled at me. He loves the shock. They went by. He loves getting away with it. And they're going out on a date where I'd love to be going. And I'm aware of both of these realities and the, dis the distance between those two is so dramatic, so amazing, so violent. I literally just talked about that. The two completely different realities. And he's sitting here bragging about it. I was completely aware of these different realities. I, God, I'm, I don't even know. I'm just gonna finish it and let it play. I just, this guy, this guy is so cringe. These women were killed. They were assaulted. They were abducted all because this man hated his mother, okay? Holy f***ing sh Get a grip. And all this time, Kemper was able to seem normal. He even hung out at a bar across the street from the courthouse, making friends with policemen, trying to pick up information. They'd buy me a beer, I'd buy them a beer. Uh, casual relationships, but that was, I was poking around a little bit, trying to find some things out. <laughs> I knew they wouldn't be privy to hot information, but there were some things that were bothering me, like were there any speculations on how they were dying? Did the cops like you? Like I said, a friendly nuisance. I got in the way, and it was deliberate. Again, friendly nuisances are dismissed. How did you get the knowledge to outsmart Take a shot person? every... Watching He did not just ask that. Dude! <laughs> Edmund Kemper, how did you get the knowledge to outsmart the police? Why the f would you ask that? Why would you fucking ask him that? Why? This is TV in the 70s. This is it. This is coverage on, of serial killers in the 70s. Please, this is the same thing when that interviewer asked Richard Ramirez, well, now that you've joined the ranks of Ted Bundy and the Green River Killer, joined the ranks? God, I hate this shit man like i mean i get it it was the 70s and there were no parameters and there was no ethics of you know covering murders or true crime and stuff but this shit is annoying because people still watch these videos and they don't realize how cringe these motherfuckers are now let's watch ed brag about himself again while i collect myself and try not to have a breakdown on a monday television believe it or not joseph wambaugh police story got some tremendous insights into not just the gimmicks, the actual things, the tidbits that you would pick up from their procedures. But the mechanics behind that, the logic behind it, was I would not allow myself to walk into even a potential trap of behavior. I'm so smart. And one of those was talking about those crimes too much to people, initiating conversations about that. There was a uh, memorial service for two of the victims. Yes. Were you tempted to go? Yes. But kill me don't come to my fucking funeral don't even consider it don't talk about it on tv don't absolutely not because especially like, bro i'm telling you man especially if i've been in heaven longer than you i already made some friends up there i'd uh seen one too many episodes of one too many crime shows where that is one of the available resources for clues was he killing these people while his mother was still alive because I think that that was like the the old if, if that's true the ultimate form of sadism there was his mother worked at the school so he started killing women at the school to get back at his mom and he enjoyed living in that same house and just snaking it out under his mom's this is like this is so just move out like mo like mo move out seriously and and it, and then like this is major incel vibes homie you're six foot nine. People put fucking 6'2 in their tender bio. Like, you're good. Like, just fucking move out. And I talk about it this way because there are people out here like Ed Kemper that think they're fucking smart and would go out and kill people because of mommy issues. Like, this is like, I'm having, like, I'm peeing crying right now because I'm so fucking annoyed. Like, why did 10 people have to die because he was using them as pawns to get back at his mother? How embarrassing is that? Actually embarrassing. If you are killing people to get back at your mother, that is embarrassing. I had the personal effects and identification of the last two co-eds that had been murdered about two months before. Oh my right God. Right the guns in the closet, in a box. Could he have seen it? No, but when he arrested me for having all those guns and went through the rest of the closet looking to see if there were any pistols or anything else, he wouldn't have, couldn't have helped notice a purse, a book bag, 
and co-ed ID inside of those belonging to their two latest murder victims. I back up and said, oh, excuse me. I just remembered so. And instantly he responds to what I'm saying. Also, what the f***? The two latest murder victims? Can you imagine being a family member of one of the young women that was killed and he's talking about it like it's a roster and then they're airing this on national television? My hand moves. Back we go outside and he's still thinking, boy, this is a really nice and helpful guy here. Uh, some of these people uh, do what you and I do to become better killers. They practice their trade. Did he temper stop himself uh, toward the end of his career? Kemper says he did. He says he could have gone on. He said he had no, fantasies he... of killing uh, uh, dozens more people, of leaving a trail of bodies across the country. And at one point, he just got on the telephone and turned himself in. He said it was time for the killing to stop. In his case, he said uh, publicly that it was his mother that he was killing all along. And when he killed his mother, uh, that was the end. Okay. A very deep psychological observation from himself that uh, may be very accurate. For two months, I hadn't killed. And I said, it's not going to happen to any more girls. It's got to stay between me and my mother. And it's got to, I can't get away from her. We're still fighting. She's still belittling me. She's still, I'm like a puppet on a string. Belittling me, yeah. She knows all my buttons and I dance like a puppet with that pain. And okay, breaking news yes you're okay i don't know who needs to hear this yes your parents know exactly how to push all of your buttons your parents are probably the ones that created your triggers so yes they know how to push your buttons and make you dance like a monkey that's for everyone they f made them your siblings and your family or whoever you grew up with created your triggers so yeah they push those buttons so when you're around those people you have to protect yourself consciously right like come on <laughs> Like, what is this, breaking news? What do you think, they just appeared out of thin air? And it had even gotten physical to where I had physically grabbed her and thrown her onto her bed, trying to emphasize a point that she's I was threatening to kill her. So here I pick up these two young ladies in Berkeley on Ashby Avenue. One has flowers in her hand, petite little dolls. They're in granny dresses and they're hitchhiking, a couple of real experts. I want to see how together I am, if I can resist this temptation. You going to Walnut Creek? Great. <sighs> and they get in my car. They want to go one way. I know they need to go the other. If they go the way they're insisting on, we're headed right back out to where the first two co-eds were murdered. And I'm saying to myself, oh my God, all I got to do is relax, and they'll take me to their death. I've got the gun in the car the same one I've been doing it with. I insisted, as gently as I could, I took them where they needed to go, to their college. That was one week before I murdered my mother. I said, she's got to die, and I've got to die, or girls like that are going to die. And that's when I decided I'm going to murder my mother. I knew a week before she died, I was going to kill her. And she went out to a party, she got soused, she came home, went to sleep. I was woken up by that. I got, came out. I walked up to her bed. She's laying there reading a paperback. As many thousands of nights before. And she said, oh, I suppose you're going to want to sit up all night and talk now. Shit. And I looked at her. I said, no. I said, good night. That's, that's what choked him up? <laughs> That comment, him repeating and reliving that comment is what choked him up. Not talking about stabbing the girl to death, you know, bringing the two girls in the car, shooting this person, the police coming to his house for one thing. The one comment that choked Edmund Kemper up was his mom reading a paperback book, drunk in bed, saying, I guess you're going to want to talk all night, huh? Move out of your mom's fucking house. Like... How dare you make this your life story? Your mom is a nagging bitch. And then you decapitated people over it? Like, who does that? Who fucking does that? And then people platformed him afterwards and then acted like he was smart. Chat, chat, is this person smart? Is this guy smart? Talking about some, he had 145 IQ. That was just a fear mongering thing. Like, how could a smart man do this? And now he gonna get choked up over his mom saying, you gotta stay up all night talking? You know what I would've done? I would've sat down. I would've been like, yeah, mom, I'm gonna talk all night. What you gonna do about it, bitch? What you gonna do? I would've just run my mouth. Not gone out and killed nobody. God damn, dude. Cry about it, Ed. But I knew I was gonna kill her. Cry about you know? it. 
and it's so cold, it's so hard. And that's the first time in 10 years I've looked at it that way. I mean, that intensely, that honestly. It hurts. Because I'm not a lizard, I'm not from under a rock. I came out of her vagina. See? Came out. I'm sorry. I don't know why the captions say vagina, but <laughs> that's funny. Anyways, fuck this guy. My mother. And in a rage, I went right back in. For seven years, she said, I haven't had sex with a man because of you, my murderous son. It's one of our arguments. I cut off her head, and, I'm, and I humiliated her corpse. I said, there. You know? A sick young woman dead because of the way she raises her son and the way her son is raised. No. The way he grows up. No. No. Her... We must accept that sometimes our parents are either pieces of shit or sometimes they do their best and they don't get everything right. Or sometimes... Sometimes you might be raised, you know, we're raised to believe that our mom and dad have this big S on their chest. They're Superman, super mom, super dad, or whatever. There becomes a point in your life where your parents become humanized. Your parents are people. They are humans. I mean, the fact that Ed says that his mom was an alcoholic to begin with, like, what does that tell you, you know? You could have a parent that was abused as a child, and then in turn, the abused becomes the abuser. And now you're being abused. Move out. Your parents are not perfect. You are not here on this earth to chase your mother's affection. That is not your purpose. That is not why you're here. And sure, follow your parents' direction. 16, 17, 18, fuck it. Maybe even 20. But after a while, you must break out of that and define your own life. The grandmother and her daughter-in-law, your mother, were two women very important in your life. And you killed them both. Could you say what they were like that led them to the same fate? Same thing that kept them from ever being friends. They were both aggressive, um, matriarchal women. They'd been the daughters of strong matriarchal women. I still loved my mother, and it's hard for somebody to comprehend okay. that you murder your mother through love. It isn't a rational process. It's a very painful process. It isn't rational. And I've got to still live with that. Why did you wind up giving yourself? I, I think that comes from um, the societal or the culture standards that we must love our mothers. Your parents can do bad things and you are allowed to be mad at them for them. You don't have to internalize it. You don't have to bottle it up. You don't need to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with them. You don't need to even get the accountability from your parents. Trust and believe that what they did was wrong. Trust and believe that they have treated you like you're powerless and you're small and you're voiceless and then do what you want with that, right? I like, look, somebody just said in chat, I don't even claim my mother anymore. Fine, it, it, exactly, it, fine. I'm tired of society telling us that we have to forgive somebody just because they share the same blood as them. Absolutely not. It had to stop. It had to stop uh, once my mother was dead. There's almost a cathartic process at that point. I got physically ill right then when she died, when I murdered her. And once she was dead, there was no way I could back out. I had backed down from giving up a thousand times. You know, I used to get drunk and go sit out in front of the sheriff's department in a parking lot across the street on one of those little concrete parking berms. And I just sit there and say, <laughs> Okay, stop. Can. Stop. <laughs> chat this is so aggressive gonna show my mama how skin hungry i am okay without context to the stream that's gonna be like one of the creepiest comments <laughs> but if you <laughs> it's like not that word i could get it it just sounds so bad did you know that it was gonna come out that way did you know i was gonna read that i'm gonna go show my mama how skin hungry i am Bro, don't, okay, we know what you mean, but don't say it like that. <laughs> don't say, just say, say, Mom, I need a hug. <laughs> Act like you're going to walk up and be like, Mama, I'm skin hungry. <laughs> like, <laughs> As you're just sitting on the couch watching TV and your 12-year-old comes up and says that to you, I would call the police. The clanging doors, I could still hear them. 
No, because it'll never open again. You know, so I, I, I uh, rationalize that you give up. You're Somebody came in and said, what did I just come into? And the next person said, mother, I crave skin. <laughs> the plate. I'm going to get the room. I'm going to get the room. <laughs> I cannot fucking reach out right now. And y'all are not about to fuck up my YouTube video. <laughs> Sometimes on YouTube, when stuff like this happens with chat, they cut it out of the videos and then YouTube doesn't get the context. And then they'll just start seeing all the crazy shit that you guys are saying in the side. So probably what's going to happen is my editor is going to cut all of this out. And then chat's just going to see you guys see, saying, mother, I crave skin. <laughs> I'd be giving away my freedom and I don't need to. But I look back on that and wish I had earlier when I was saying those things to myself. The people who were later dead wouldn't be. The regret that came later would have not had to be people would still be with their families with their loved ones oh shut up F oh shut the fuck up you stupid sack of fucking shit okay through this entire interview he has talked about these women as though they are not people i called this out earlier when i said they were like rosters and then he comes back and he says and those people not those things those people would still be with their families he doesn't believe that he doesn't believe that statement at all. That is a manipulative statement that he's putting out to put out whatever narrative he wants the public to believe about him while he's being platformed, okay? You sat here and talked about these women like they were objects the entire time, and now he's like, they would do it with their families and their loved ones. Oh, shut the fuck up, mommy's boy.